thank you so much, Leah, for joining us today. And we're excited to hear all you have to say. I have a few questions to ask you. The first one is, what events in your youth or beliefs led you to become an activist? Well, I'm really blessed to be raised by two parents who both care deeply about the earth and about social justice. Both my parents are uh, religious figures. My mother was the first African-American clergy to be ordained as a Unitarian Universalist minister. My dad is a lay leader in the UU church and they were very involved in anti-war, uh, women's rights, civil rights work and my father also in conservation work. And so that certainly influenced my frame of reference as a young person where it, it went without questioning that every person was responsible for tikkun olam, that is healing and repairing the world. But I would say for me personally, as a multiracial black person growing up, uh, going to school in a mostly white town, I experienced a lot of direct bullying and discrimination and harshness from my peers that politicized me around racial justice and at the same time found solace in the, the forest and the lakes and the mountains and the soils as a place of refuge. And so that inspired me to become a fierce defender and, and friend of the natural world. And I know your grandmother was influential to you. Is that correct? <laughs> Absolutely. So as far as my relationship to farming, uh, my first gardening teacher was my grandmother, Brown Lee McCullough in blessed memory. She passed away when I was 20. And despite having lost hold of her family land outside of Rock Hill, South Carolina, where they had a whole farm and forest and beekeeping, she held on to that agrarian way of life when she moved as part of the Great Migration up to the Boston area. And I remember as a young child getting to work in her strawberry patch and tend her crab apple tree in the yard and to make uh, preserves and, and other kitchen products, you know, from those, those wonderful fruits. And to this day, I'm still a fruit grower. I love growing strawberries. They're my absolute favorite. And I have an orchard of several hundred apple trees that I tend as well. What continues to motivate you to um, do what you do and what guides you, what gives you courage? My spouse, Jonah and I, and our two young children back in 2005, we had moved to the south end of Albany, which is a neighborhood under food apartheid and really struggled to get fresh food into the bellies of our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmers markets, community gardens, grocery store, you know, even a bus line to get to the grocery store was lacking. So when our neighbors found out that my spouse and I knew how to farm, they started encouraging us to create a farm for the people. And that is where the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born, right, right there in the south end of Albany. You know, it took many years to manifest. We, we built our home from scratch, you know, out of the clay of the earth of waste straw uh, from nearby farms, out of the sick trees that were harvested from the area. But in the end, we're able to open a farm in 2010 dedicated to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. So true to the original impetus, we did start a doorstep delivery program of fresh food in the South End and surrounding neighborhoods. But overlaid on top of that uh, were education programs for the rising generation of black and brown farmers, people who've historically been excluded from agency in the food system, as well as a whole lot of rabble rousing for justice. And what has inspired me to keep going in this work, because as folks know, being a farmer is not easy. Being an activist is not easy. Being an organizational leader, building your own house, none of these things are easy. Living in community. But what's kept me going is seeing the incredible power of this rising generation of youth, of young black and brown farmers who believe that it's time to restore our rightful place of dignity on the land, who believe that it's imperative that we provide food and medicine to those who otherwise wouldn't have it, who believe that you know we are the younger siblings of creation, that we need to heed the wisdom of the eagles, the mountains, the salamanders, the trout as our elder siblings and really, really see a way forward through a perspective of ecological humility. So when I see folks starting High Hog Farm or Katatumbo Co-op or Shelterwood Collective or all of these amazing things that our alumni and partner organizations are doing, I just say, yes, 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 yes. Because, you know, back in the 90s, farming was not cool. And I didn't feel like I was part of something bigger. And now um, it feels like momentum is on our side and the, it, the, the change that we've been waiting for is happening. Do you see some systemic support for what you're doing now that you maybe didn't see at the beginning? Absolutely. So as far as systemic support, I think by way of context, it's important to understand that 
the food system as it was designed really wasn't meant to work for all people or for the earth. So whether you look at land ownership or the rights of workers or what kind of food people have to access, there's a lot of unfairness. For example, 98% of the agricultural land by value is white owned in this country. That's a huge concentration of land in one racial group. Uh, farm workers are 85% people of color, yet farm managers are only about 2% people of color and farm workers don't have the same legal protections, the same worker rights as other workers. Things like overtime pay, the right to one day off in seven, the right to collectively bargain, as well as many other sick health benefits and, and child labor protections. If you look at you know, the food that we eat, um, black and brown communities are much more likely uh, because of their zip code, essentially a history of redlining and, and housing discrimination to live in neighborhoods where they just can't access, we can't access fresh food. And so you see rates of kidney failure and diabetes and heart disease and other diet related illnesses, as well as hunger being really high in black and brown communities. So I mentioned these because systems change, policy change is really necessary to uproot some of these more entrenched issues. And I will say that recently there has been an upwelling of support. For example, if you look at the Justice for Black Farmers Act, which was introduced into Congress in 2020 by Cory Booker, among others, it provided an opportunity for debt relief for Black farmers who had been really taken advantage of by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and by other lenders. It provided for an avenue for uh, black farmers to be able to access land through purchasing land after having lost 16 million acres to racial discrimination. There was all kinds of provisions for education uh, for farmers and for reforming the Civil Rights Office of the USDA. Now, granted, this legislation hasn't passed, but the fact that there were, you know, four co-signatories to introduce the bill, it got national attention. The fact that these conversations about the rights of farmers and land were part of presidential debates that's huge. And so we know that it, we know that it took, you know, four or 500 years to get things really messed up. So it might take a few generations to fix them. But the fact that the conversations on the table in the halls of Congress and the White House, you know, means that there is some hope that we'll see change, at least by my children's generation. So I will say that it wasn't until, you know, my early adulthood that I heard anything about racial injustice, systemic racial injustice baked into systems of housing and food and access to land it simply was not part of the curriculum. And I get very fearful with the attack on what they're calling critical race theory, because it essentially means erasing the truth about what it took to build our nation. Our nation truly was built on attempted genocide and, and land theft and slavery. That's where the wealth came from. And so if we pretend that didn't happen, we're going to raise a whole generation of, of people who are apt to repeat that type of oppression. So I do think that, you know, age appropriate truth telling is super important. Your voice is really a critical one for them to hear. I appreciate it. Uh, so what advice do you have for young activists and youth today? So the advice that I have for young activists today is to find the intersection of what the world needs and what makes you come alive, because the world truly needs people who have come alive. And activism is very hard work. And what will make us able to sustain that decade after decade is when we are truly in love with the people, the land, the object of our protection and advocacy. So make sure to nurture that love. If it's the earth that you're taking a stand for, we can't let all of the meetings and to do's get in the way of that weekly hike to a mountain summit that rekindles our passion for the natural world. If it's racial justice that we're working on, we need to make sure that we are investing in black joy and cultural celebration so that we're in touch with absolutely being in love with what it is that we're defending. So yes, find what makes you come alive. As we're going through this pandemic, what advice would you have for young people who've spent maybe three of their high school years or three of their college years on Zoom? How did they transition to, to really keeping those joys and commitments alive? Well, first, my sincerest compassion goes out to the young people who have spent formative years looking at pixels on a screen and not able to hug and goof around with their friends and flirt and play and have parties. I think, I think time will only tell what kind of healing will be needed. So I would just start with self-compassion. You know, these are unprecedented times and what young people are going through, no other generation has ever gone through before in this way. And so being very gentle with self as we heal, as we emerge, as we figure out how to reacclimate to in-person social connection, but know that the pixels aren't real. 
they are not real. And so whatever time it, you need to reacclimate, make sure that progress is steady because we need, we need each other in real life. We need our heartbeats, our breath. We need the wind on our faces. We need the sun warming our skin. All of these things are real and they are calling us home. Thank you so much for talking with me. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I love your project. Thanks. Bye, Leah.